We're at another topic, another conversation where my passion for advocacy and working conditions within the TV and film industry and my standing as a Doctor Who fan, a very outspoken Doctor Who fan, merge together and there's a topic that I feel very compelled to talk about. So for those of you who may not know, uh, there's a series of special features on the Blu-ray collection sets where Matthew Sweet does in-depth conversations with somebody involved in the season. And for the season 22 set, he's done three. He did one with Michael Grade, he did one with Colin Baker, but he also did one with Nicola Bryant. And Nicola Bryant does an hour-long interview with Matthew Sweet talking about her time working on Doctor Who. And there was a subject of conversation that nobody was really expecting... Uh, to come from this conversation but uh, Nicola Bryant talked about it uh, and I wanted to play you the clip now I've truncated the beginning of it because there's a lot of Matthew Sweet asking questions so I guess mainly truncated the beginning of it but the answer I have left unedited uh, it's like a three minute clip so I apologize for the lengthiness of the clip but I wanted to play it in its totality the context is that Matthew asked Nicola Bryant why did she work on Doctor in Distress in the 1980s? And she was like, I was contracted to. I had to do it. John Nathan Turner said that I had to do it. Um, but then the topic of conversation came up about a pantomime that she did with Colin Baker in the mid-1980s, which was also produced by John Nathan Turner. Let's take a look at the clip. Uh, I did everything that I was told, you know. That's amazing, isn't it? Bar the one, one time yeah. I did just go, I don't want to do that. What was that? when I was asked to do pantomime. And I did it for professional reasons. Hmm. I just said, I don't think that's a good idea hmm. to do a pantomime in Brighton at the same time as filming Doctor Who when we do 18 hour days when we're filming. How are we meant to do that and do our job well? But the pantomime did happen. That was a really sticky moment between me and John because we were really good friends by then. And he asked me to do the pantomime and I genuinely thought about it and I guess he thought there's no way I'd say no. And I said no and I got my agent to say no because I thought that's what you do. And it was made very clear to me that no was not an option. Very clear. I was, shall we say, punished. I was in trouble. You know, um, on set from the moment I'd said, he said, your agent's just called and you know, I was not spoken to for the rest of that day. And everybody wonders why I didn't do the um, Jimmy Savile. And everyone thinks it's because I suspected Jimmy Savile. No, this was as a demonstration of how I could be punished. So Janet so, was asked to do it instead of me. So that sketch with the Sontarans and and uh, that was to that was to spite you yes. that non-appearance. Yes. That was to make it very clear that you do as you're told. So I spoke to my agent, and my agent went back and thanked them for the offer to be paid a very very small amount of money to star in this pantomime. Two shows a day, six days a week. And what was your relationship with John Nathan Turner from that point onwards? Because it's not like you, you know, had quite a lot of time to run, hadn't it? This was sort of in he the, had, the yeah. middle of, of, of um, your time on the programme. It unnerved me. And then I just swept it aside. As he did. Mm. As he did. It was like... Your agent was really bad to advise you to do that, Nicola. And I wasn't going to go, well, actually, it was me who mm -hmm. said, you know, and I did, I did explain in floods of tears to him. I said, I wasn't snubbing you. I said, when he got, I said, I'm not snubbing you. I am, I'm being professional about this job. The hours would be too long. The laugh was about, I don't know, six months later. There was a job I really wanted to do. They were interested in me at the BBC for a massive drama serial. And I said, can I do this at the same time? No. 
so yeah it's like an hour-long interview that's just a three-minute portion from it as of course you should do support the official release of course uh, check out the full interview it's not all doom and gloom stuff but i first became aware of this interview by seeing nicola bryant uh, do a twitter thread um one of five so when a woman goes on record and tells the truth about bullying or other issues in the workplace there are always people ready to rationalize discard their account or when it is long after the event say the memory cheats so she has to keep on defending herself to set the record straight of course john nathan turner waited until i'd finished the pantomime and filming season 22 before telling me i wouldn't be on jim will fix it this makes complete sense if you actually think about it I was told directly to my face by John Nathan Turner that I would not be doing the show and that he would be getting Janet because, quote, she doesn't say no to things. The implication of his words was clear. I was so upset by this, my then husband booked a very last minute holiday to Venice, which was then used by John Nathan Turner as the, quote, official reason I was not taking part. We went to Carnival, where I could easily hide behind a mask so no one rec would recognise me and we could be a couple. Sorry uh, to Janet Fielding, uh, tagged on Twitter, to have to associate you with this time storm in a, team cup, in a teacup, I'm sure you'd understand. So, additional context. Uh, so, when Nicola Bryant was... Uh, cast in Doctor Who by John Nathan Turner towards the end of the fifth Doctor's era she was basically told by the showrunner at the time John Nathan Turner who was like the Russell T Davis Chris Chibnall equivalent of the time uh, that she had to not let on that she was in a relationship she had to be seen to be single for the press so you know you know so the, the dads could be on board with Doctor Who which is very yikes was very yikesy uh, which is the additional context there when she goes to Venice she can actually be with her partner and they could go to carnival behind a mask and they could actually be like a couple and i also believe that she had to pretend to be american to the press as well like someone in the in the chat was saying when nicola bryant was talking in that clip oh i keep on forgetting she's not american so yeah and also for the context the the pantomime was cinderella where nicola bryant was asked to be the lead in that and john nathan turner was producing colin baker was in it kate o'mara and anthony ainley they were in it as well but because of john nathan turner's influence they would have to be doing season 22 of doctor who and cinderella rehearsals at the same time time lash even had to be refilmed and re-recorded during their time when they were working on cinderella there's even a behind the scenes feature on the season 22 box set where they filmed all of the studio stuff where they had to re-up the, the the set to film and pick up time lash because of the cinderella production and they even did press junkets and press photos on the set of time lash because they were doing 18 hour days for doctor who and then they'd have to get into cinderella costumes on the set of time lash and then do press junkets on the Doctor Who set for the pantomime that they were also doing, which they had to do, because if you didn't do it, John Nathan Turner would punish you. Now, this is, of course, like, some people will just talk about this in terms of, like, first world problems. You know, it's TV, and, like, these people are acting, they're being big names in the 1980s. But you've also got to remember the power dynamic at play here. Nicola Bryant, when she was cast as Perry under John Nathan Turner, was in her early to mid-twenties, a young actress, a young up-and-coming TV star in one of the biggest shows in the UK. And she doesn't want to do the pantomime at the same time she's doing doctor who even colin baker has gone on record since um playing the doctor since john nathan turner passed saying that he regrets doing cinderella at the same time he felt like his work on both of them suffered as a result this is a pretty clear consensus from those involved but john nathan turner punished nicola bryant by not letting her be in the gym or fix it special and got janet fielding instead with the official reason being that she's gone on on holiday uh, to venice so I know that the bar in terms of onset behavior and power dynamics has been significantly lowered in recent years and months because of stuff like the Me Too movement and and stuff like what we've heard on set and on location with Noel Clark and John Barrowman, of course. But sexual dynamics are not the only ways in which people should not conduct themselves in a professional environment. John Nathan Turner, by this account from Nicola Bryant, by all intents and purposes, was a bully. And I know that some stuff has come out about John Nathan Turner in regards to his personal life and controversies and stuff, which honestly, I'm not really, really clued up on. I've actually got the John Nathan Turner uh, biography 
from 10 acre films i've not read it yet and i've not looked into all of the other stuff uh, and zero kara said the cause of janet fielding she had no idea that was going on jnt punishing little brian yeah that's true uh, janet fielding is an innocent party in this she doesn't know anything about what happened behind the scene of she wouldn't know she wasn't associated with the show anymore outside of fan appearances and stuff thomas ray colin looked out for nicola as a gentleman oh yeah yeah absolutely Th those two got on so well and considering everything that was going on in colin's life as well in the early to mid 80s stuff that was happening in his family and the loss of his child really like yeah it was it must it must have been really tough in their personal lives as well and also just for nicola bryant to not be able to be seen out and about with her then husband or the, her then partner because john nathan turner deemed it so for the publicity of the program john nathan turner has been called a showman but if that's the extent of showmanship then i think that the ends don't justify the means so yeah we talk about the decorum of the, of the professional standards uh, this is something that is relatively small potatoes in terms of um you know like like i mentioned harvey weinstein no clark things like that but it's still worth condemning and still worth talking about people said in the chat as well that jnt was also addicted to sophie aldred will thomas in the chat i can't claim to know all of that stuff and i unfortunately i, I don't know all of that uh, i believe it though so what we need to talk about of course this was 40 years ago, nearly 40 years ago, when John Nathan Turner took over as showrunner. Um, he's, of course, no longer alive. He's no longer working, unless he's working from beyond the grave. I think that's some uh, that's a horror movie potential right there. But when it comes to uh, the power dynamics, I would rather that Doctor Who, in the mid to late 1980s, was not made un under that sort of duress. I think that we need to have a zero tolerance when it comes to the uh, the 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 behavior of the higher ups, and I'm not just saying this in the 1980s. I'm saying this now as well. One thing that absolutely is at play here as well is also the power dynamics as well. Nicola Bryant was a, a young actress. She wasn't being paid very much for Doctor Who or the Cinderella Panto that she did, even though she was working two jobs, two very high profile jobs. But John Nathan Turner, though, was quite a, a wealthy and influential person at the BBC as well. The type of person who could hold massive extravagant parties for him and his friends every single week. Um, and, you know, those Hawaiian shirts aren't cheap. So, like Alex L said, people say uh, Chibs is the worst show, or at least he seems like a decent guy. JNT is the real worst show because he ran the show badly and treated people badly. Yeah, th there's the reputation of John Nathan Turner as something that I think as a fandom who grew up with these stories and also, as myself, like I've said, I think Remembrance of the Daleks, which is a John Nathan Turner produced story, it was my first exposure to the classic series. It's something that the fandom kind of needs to have a bit of a reckoning with. We need to also make sure that, um, you know, when people <laughs> be making jokes and bringing children into this, please stop us not for, like, I, I understand the sentiment of why, why Alex mentioned it though. Like people just see being a, a good producer as the quality of the output, which of course is what the main audience members see, but it also makes me a bit uneasy with Russell T. Davis coming back and knowing the stuff that was happening behind the scenes during his tenure. I really hope that him, Julie Gardner, Phil Collins, and have grown and changed and they've done, uh, they've got way more safeguards in place or that they have at least learned from their mistakes if the mistakes came from them. I really hope that happens because I would rather that Doctor Who, despite all the stories in the 1980s that I love, I would prefer that Doctor Who was not made under the scrutiny of a bully like john nathan turner queen 18 being a good producer has also been kind to the cast and crew too you could, yeah when you're a producer where you're the showrunner you are you have a duty of care to the to the people below you the people you hire the people you employ to get the job done the producer is the one who takes the fall and takes the rap when it comes to risk assessments and stuff like the actual logistics and the dangers of working on set they have to sign off on those things and if there is an issue the producer is the one the first in the firing line which comes with a lot of responsibility but yeah so sorry the sweet interview about perry's costume for the photo shoot was shocking there was a lot of stuff that's come out about the 1980s and everything under john nathan turner it's uh yeah and also things that were happening which were maybe uh, you look back on it and it's it was illegal then and might have been a bit more acceptable now but it's still stuff that uh, uh kind of puts john nathan turner in a really questionable light now fans in terms of doctor who as a show 
uh, they they do kind of owe a debt to John Nathan Turner for keeping the whole production running. Because if John Nathan Turner left the show, then the BBC would have cancelled it immediately. That's why he stayed on as long as he did. He was show running for nearly 10 years. What was it? Season, um, what was it? Uh, I don't know. I can't see because my on-air signs are the way. What was it? Season 18 to season 26, nearly 10 years of TV. So we kind of owe him that debt in a sense. But honestly, I would rather that, that those eight seasons weren't made if the people working on it felt intimidated. If Nicola Bryant didn't feel safe or did not feel looked after by the higher ups on that set. It, it kind of makes, I think the fandom kind of needs to have a bit of more of a, of a reckoning with Doctor Who in the 1980s. So that we at least, like, obviously I don't think anybody in their right mind would endorse the behaviour but I also think it needs to be part of the conversation a bit more regularly so that we know that stuff that people can maybe get away with today they do not get away with it like for example if let's say for the sake of argument that Russell T Davis who showrun worked on Casanova wanted oh David Tennant I want you to be the 10th Doctor and David Tennant said no but then Russell T. Davis bullied and intimidated David Tennant into being in Doctor Who, to being the 10th Doctor. And he did that under duress. Sure, we get the great 10th Doctor, but we also have a leading actor who's being bullied into having their career autonomy taken away. There was the bit at the end of the clip as well, where Nicola Bryant said that she was offered a great BBC drama, but because of that relationship with john nathan turner couldn't do it there was some rumors going along in the 1980s that john nathan turner did not get on with the higher-ups at the bbc one reason why maybe they wanted the show cancelled because they didn't like working with john nathan turner and the more that comes out about him the more that that could have some credence to it so yeah there's no easy way to have this conversation but I think it's a conversation that's worth at least attempting to have, right? Like, like I don't, I don't know if I'm doing a very good job at communicating the thought process here. I'm quite tired, but you know, I think it's at least worth acknowledging. And kudos to Nicola Bryant as well for speaking out about it and talking about it. And I'm glad that there is no animosity between Nicola Bryant and Janet Fielding. Uh, like, I don't think it would be deserved, but who am I to tell Nicola Bryant how to feel about the situation? She was the one in the middle of it who would speak to John Nathan Turner, her boss, in floods of tears begging for an apology, begging for forgiveness because of the communication between her and her agent. For Tom Shook, we're talking about isolated nasty incidents. I certainly don't think JT was a bastard all the time. Indeed, I've heard Colin, Nicola, and others speaking rather warmly about him. There's definitely going to be the good and the bad times. Like, you know, Colin Baker would uh, be one attending all of these, like, John Nathan Turner parties as well. I, I'm sure they got on quite well behind the scenes. But you don't, you still don't want a power dynamic. Even if it is just an isolated incident where you get along with somebody 90% of the time and then the other 10% of the time, you're fearful for your profession. I don't think that 10% is worth it or you don't need that 10% at all. I'm not, I don't think that creatives and the cast and crew will 100% get along 100% of the time. You're going to get your creative disagreements, but the power play and the intimidation is not needed at all and it's also a case of like Nicola Bryant is the newcomer or at least one of the newcomers like Colin Baker was there as well like she's the new companion she's like the female objectified face of the show with a companion Perry and then you've got John Nathan Turner the boss who can fire you at any moment now I don't know if that altercation about the pantomime resulted in Nicola Bryant leaving the show midway through Trial of a Time Lord. Uh, I don't know if uh, if she left or she was pushed. I don't know. Maybe the chat can correct me. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I'm glad that Nicola Bryant is able to feel comfortable talking about this just so that we as a fandom and as like general community are able to acknowledge that this happened 
and also are able to have zero tolerance if we heard that it came out in future. Like, we we look back fondly on Christopher Eccleston speaking out against what happened to him with Russell T. Davis and Julie Gardner and Phil Collinson. But we are also incredibly happy and excited that Russell T. Davis is back. I, it's that dichotomy which I think makes the conversation quite difficult to have, especially because John Nathan Turner's been dead for a long time, before the show even came back in 2005. Queen 18, I think talking about this as part of progress as we need to learn about it to make sure it doesn't happen again. I, yeah, I also think it's worth talking about so we know what our lines are, right? I mean, everybody knows that, you know, everybody in their right mind condemns what Noel Clark did. You know, everybody, for the most part, at least condemns what John Barrowman did even if they have to have a load of asterisks next next to it, okay? I think once you have these conversations, you know where your line is, where, where you draw your invisible moral line to know what is acceptable on set behavior. And I think that uh, a conversation like this is worth having so that we can be more effective in communicating our grievances and our lines in a current setting. So, yeah, you know, I, I don't have too much more to say about this other than stuff like this, I'm certain, still happens. Like, maybe not quite as brazenly. I don't know. Maybe, yeah, maybe this stuff does happen now. Like, for example, what if um, if Chris Chibnall were to say, oh, I'm working on a new drama. Jody, will you be a part of it? You know, we worked on Doc 2, you did great, you know. And then Jody says no. And then, as a result, Chris Chibnall pulls as many strings as he can to make sure that Jody doesn't have any association with Doctor Who again as punishment. Like, oh, Jody, you can't do Big Finish. We won't sign off on you on Big Finish during the license because you didn't come back for my drama. That would be pretty cut and dry. Like, we'd acknowledge that that's a bad thing. I'm not, I don't think Chris Chibnall would do that. I'm just, you speak in hypothetical so you know where your line is, okay? Like, this is how we figure this out as a species, okay? Thought experiments. Okay? So, we need to also be thinking if Russell T. Davis did the same thing with David Tennant or Shooty Gatwa or Christopher Eccleston. Would we have the same reaction just because it's Russell T. Davis as opposed to Chris Chibnall? You know? Conversations worth happening and worth thinking about. So, Ricardo, that sounds like what happened to Chris. Yeah, what happened to Chris, though, is that he wasn't happy with the onset working conditions and the way that um, the below the line crew were treated. Um, and he wanted to bow out after just the one season. Oliver Dallas Media, from what I know, Nicholas departure was mutually agreed with JNT because of the hiatus. If she stayed on longer, then she would have ended up staying in the show longer than most doctors. Yeah, yeah, that I think that makes sense. Yeah, because there was the 18 month hiatus between season 22 and season 23. And Perry, as a companion, had a really good run. There's not many companions which stay for almost the entire tenure of a doctor, like ones that are synonymous with their respective doctors. Like you've got Jamie with um uh with the second doctor you've got you've got perry with the sixth doctor you've got tegan with the fifth doctor ace with a kind of lesser extent to to sylvester mccoy the seventh doctor but she's kind of the definitive like doctor companion relationship um and i think nicola bryant had a really good run i think that she shines in those seasons even if the relationship between the sixth doctor and perry isn't always really working so recover it yes what about yes yes of course yes it kind of shows how much where my mind's at where I don't, <laughs> I don't even remember Yaz. I like, I like Yaz as well, but, you know. Hey, Jay, isn't Perry now canonically still alive? I remember reading that somewhere. Oh, yeah, at the end of Trial of a Time Lord. Spoiler alert for for a nearly 40-year-old season. Once the trial's over, um, the Sixth Doctor goes to meet the Inquisitor and says, oh, what you saw was fake. Uh, she's actually gotten married to King Yukarnos, which is the short film by Pete Mateek that winds up on the season 22 trailer. So, yeah, she's canonically alive. Whether or not she's still alive in the Doctor Who universe, you know, who knows? But she she did survive Trial of a Time Lord. James Topper, she was displeased, however, with the retcon at the end of the season, which suggests that Perry had married King Yukarnos, as her and Brian Blessed had not played any romantic interaction between characters. There's that great scene, though, where they are talking about uh, the afterlife for King Yukarnos. I think that's that was a really nice scene. I do think, as well that the ending of Mind Warp is one of the 
best scenes in Doctor Who history. Like, it's a fierce performance when she wakes up on the operating table. She's dropped the American accent as well, and her brain has been trans- Kif's brain has been transplanted. Strong. It free of pain. So good. And then Brian Blessed comes in, realizes that this is not the woman that, uh, that he, that he loves. Like that, Brian Black genuinely like heartbreaking reaction as he tries to put two and two together, and then he shoots and kills her, and then we transition from that to the most heartbreaking line read of the Sixth Doctor's tenure. You killed Perry. That line read gives me life. He's so good. And, like, I know that it's a meme that the end of Trial of a Time Lord episodes end with a dramatic zoom-in to the Sixth Doctor, but the one that ends Mind Warp is so killer. He's Doctor. No. I was taken out of time for another reason, and I have every intention of finding out what it is. So... Oh! So good. Anyway, yeah... Mind Warp is my favourite Sixth Doctor story, on TV at least. I'm sure Big Finish might have su surpassed it somewhere. But on TV, 80s Doctor Who does not get better than Mind Warp.